Oh, we got two minutes. Y'all got time to talk. You got two minutes, unless you want to start early. We can quit late. But in the meantime, while we're trying to get it together, turn to 196. 196. Hey, why don't you go ahead and stand up and we can sing these songs. It's 196. On, on 196. Y'all ready? <laughs> Here we go. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. His loving arms around me Drew me back into His way Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story Of the Christ who died for me Sing it with the saints of glory Gathered by the crystal sea he will keep me till the river flows its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall be. Yes, I'll sing the wonderful story of the Christ to write for me. Remember that song? It's an old one. There's another one that's called uh, 194 Cents. Jesus came into my heart. Jesus. 
on that, please, sir. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. How many really meant that on a Wednesday night? Good evening. Ah, okay. It's good to be in God's house again. Amen. Mm. I guess we... The reason we call it God's house is this is where God's people meet, not where God lives. I, was, I still have trouble sometimes... Years ago, they called it right. They called it the church house. It was a place for the church housed, but not the church itself. Hey, just sticking together here for some reason tonight. It's good to. It's kind of good to be back home and kind of get your feet settled long enough. I told my wife, I said, I don't think we ever settled from the time we left here Sunday morning until we got back this past Saturday. Um, it was kind of a run run thing and. And I, I figured it out. Eight hours on the road now is compared to about 24, 10 years ago. Uh, I can't. My get up and go, I think, got up and gone. So I'm struggling to, to keep up with it. But we're, we're happy to be home. And thank you for your prayers. And thank you for the, the people who did all filled in and took care of everything for us while we were gone. And uh, always a blessing and appreciation for that. Um, the faithful. You know, it's an amazing thing. The one thing that God requires above all things else is the one thing that doesn't require any talent at all to do. Be faithful. How about that? The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So no matter what else we do, and of course faithfulness is faith in action. Instead of having faith, it becomes living faith. And there's the difference for us. Here we are back in the book of Genesis chapter 27, we actually stopped uh, last Sunday evening in verse 40. But there was a question raised at the end of the service. Sister Natalia always has some good questions. And she had a question about how that Esau, uh, of course Esau and Jacob, in the womb were declared to be as they wrestled. As you all know, they had a battle going on inside from the very time of conception, it seems almost. And uh, they were declared that they were two nations warring in the mother's womb. And, of course, they were twin brothers. So you need to wonder, okay, how, how are we going to have uh, tw uh, two nations out of this? And I told her off the top of my head last week that it was a, it was a marrying into. Was Isaac, um, Isaac and Esau were brothers. But this was the problem. If you look down in chapter 27, verse 9, I'm sorry, 28 verse 9. Chapter 28, verse 9. We'll get to that, but I wanted to go ahead and cover this. <laughs> and the Bible said, Then went Esau in unto Ishmael. Remember who Ishmael is. And took unto the, unto the wives which he had, Mahathalath, uh, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebojah, to be his wife. Therein lies the entrance of the mixed race, as we'd call it. And of course, Esau did this to spite, of course, his godly side, if you will. And of course, when, when we're looking at Bible types, Ishmael and all of Ishmael's descendants are a type of the flesh. Jacob and, of course, Isaac, and who would produce Jacob is a type of the spiritual person. So you see them, by the way, that conflict's not going to end until the flesh is dead. It's going to be ongoing. It's called, Paul called it, uh, the Roman 7 of my life. And it was the things I want to do, I wind up not doing. The things I don't want to do, I wind up doing. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he said, I declare, thank God Jesus Christ my Lord. Amen. He's the deliverer. So, by the way, he never ever delivers someone who doesn't want to be delivered. He doesn't force you to be delivered. One of the things that's so mysterious about this Christian life is it would have been so wonderful if he had a crucified our flesh like his was crucified in the sense that we could have had the same pure relationship to God that he has, but he allowed us to live in dependence 
of him because we still have the flesh to live with. But here's the key. He was not going to make any more gods. And that would have been gods. Someone who could not sin. But brothers and sisters, we not only can, we do. Amen? So we need to comprehend that. Here we go. All of that is just a sidebar. It didn't cost anything. But we're starting in chapter 27, verse 41, where Jacob now is going on the run. He knows that Esau is after him. In fact, he's going to make this promise that he's going to kill him. He is because he has stolen not only his birthright, now he's taken the blessing that he should have had in his opinion. And of course, there's no mistake here. We know the blessing. You and I knew because we had already known that Jacob was going to be the one to be blessed because Jacob's name would soon be changed to Israel. And so the promise of Abraham is going to be continue on the down line through Jacob. And we'll see that beginning in, in verse 41. And Esau hated Jacob. And of course, that's nothing new, is it? We knew that from the womb. There was a battle going on. And so Jacob hated, or sorry, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, and I'm going to transliterate this so it makes a little bit more sense. My dad is about to die. And I'm going to wait till he dies. And I go through the morning of losing my father. And then I'm going to get this guy. Let's read it now. He said, the day, he says, Esau said in his heart, The days of my mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. I did a little research, and I think I even have a footnote somewhere here. That Jacob lived another 43 years after he said this. He was I guess it, here's why Jacob took off. <laughs> he was on the run. He, was, he had a lot of wisdom. He got out of the way while all the heat was going on. And I believe that God did that to preserve Jacob for what he had planned for him. <laughs> and so the Bible says in, in verse 42, And these words of Esau, her elder son, I tell you what, Rebekah is either a, a really shrewd lady or God was using her to keep Jacob alive. I believe the latter part. And listen to what happened. And of course, these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she went and, told, and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. And you know, you, 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 when you think about two brothers, and a brother, a twin, that hated his brother so much that his intent, and I readily admit that Jacob was a rascal in the sense of what he did. Does it ever amaze you that God only uses rascals? I guess you know why. He doesn't have anything else to choose from, right? All of us are qualified in that sense. But it says that I, I need you to know that your brother, your twin brother, is set out to kill you. He's purposing to kill you. By the way, the word purposing there lends itself to a covenant, making a covenant with this thing. Verse 43, it says, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, Arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. Now, Haran was where all of this started. Abraham came out of Haran, Haran and went to, went to Ur of Chaldees. And then, of course, that's where he took the call of God to leave. But Haran was like a home. This is where Laban still lived. And he says, Go to Laban, my brother. This was the brother of Rebekah. And tarry there with him a few days. I underlined the few days. And I thought to myself, 43 years, a little longer than a few days, isn't it? And until thy brother's fury turns away. Isn't that just like a mother? I believe your brother would get over it. Just give him a few days. Y'all don't read the Bible like I do. I can tell when you look at it. Uh, but that's exactly how it would affect, come over. You just, you know, your brother will be over this in a few days. Just stay away until thy brother's anger turn away from thee. And he forget <laughs> that which thou hast done. Then will I send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Now, that can really reach to a mother's heart, I'm sure. I don't, why in the world I, am I going to have to lose both of my children in, in, in one day? In verse 46, it says, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are 
of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Just think about that mother that says, I want you to marry godly. I don't want you marrying women of the land. I want you, and of course, by the way, I, I, if, if we could have whispered to Rebecca, we could have said, God's got it covered, says, don't worry about it. God's preeminence and his sovereignty was not going to allow Jacob to be killed because God had a plan for Jacob's life. And that isn't going, nothing's going to happen to that life. God's going to preserve that life until he's through using it. The same it is with you and I. Someone said the other day, well, so-and-so's days were cut short. No, ma'am. No, sir. There's no such thing. We die right on time. Amen. God's timing. God's timing. Now, I do know that there's scripture that says that you can cause your death to grow longer, and that's when you honor your father and your mother. We know that scripture's there. And I've had people tell me, well, I know somebody that lived to be so long, and they didn't honor their father and their mother. Well, you don't know how much longer they would have lived if they had. We can't out guess God, can we? And so he says, uh, she said, my life would be no good. It would just be wasted if you went out and married one of the daughters of Heth. And of course, if you do some, some searching of that, then of course you're going to find that that was part of it, the land, the people of the land. And in chapter 28, verse 1, And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Same people he's talking about, just very different names. Arise and go to Pandanaran, to the house of Bethuel, my mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Now follow this closely, because remember, this is a surplanter that's leaving. This is the man that tricked his brother out of the birthright, tricked his brother uh, out of the blessing that should have been his. And he's now sailing off, running for his life, but he's told where to go and what to do. And so verse 3 says, And God Almighty, he's continuing the blessing of Jacob on his son. And, and he called Jacob, I'm sorry, on Jacob his son. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. What he's doing is he's transferring the blessing of Abraham from himself onto his son, who will be the son of his blessings. And give thee the blessing of Abraham, there it is, to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit what? We keep crossing this, the land, and I keep hearing people that's supposed to know better that keep saying that, you know, Israel ought to just give up the West Bank. Israel ought to do this. Israel ought to do that. I think Israel better, Israel's going to do what God said they were going to do, and it doesn't make any difference if the whole world disagrees with it. And if you want to pick a fight with God, mess with Israel. That's a good way to get in trouble. So God's going to preserve Israel until he's through using it. And by the way, tonight, Israel is not back to God. They're as atheistic as they've ever been in their, in their sort of a religious way. But that won't last. There will be a turning back to God for Israel. And I'm, and I'm, I believe in a, an awesome way. That's going to be during the tribulation period. But it's going to happen because God said it would. But anyway, and he says, he's going to give you the blessing of Abraham. And he's going to give you that you may inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger. Which God gave unto Abraham. He's passing that deed, that deed of blessing, deed of promise on to Jacob, which is going to be Israel, as you well know. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Pandanaram unto Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pandanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Guess what was going to happen now? What Abraham told Jacob not to do, Esau was bound to do. He was going to spite his father. I'll show my daddy. I'll show my brother. I'll show my mother. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Pandanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father. There we go. But what happened? It happened so many times. 
young people want to say, I'm going to show my father and my mother I can do my own thing. I'm grown. And they don't even know how much toilet paper costs. I mean, we're going to launch out on our own. We're going to be on our own. Well, let me tell you, there's one thing about being grown. It doesn't mean just being a certain age. It means having the ability to take care of yourself. Somebody say amen. It comes along with the territory. If you want to be, you want to be able to do your own thing, then afford to take care of your own thing. And sometimes we don't think about that. That doesn't mean that we can't help our children from time to time. But I can tell you what we've done over the past years, ladies and gentlemen. We've made our children way too dependent upon father, mom and daddy and grandma and grandpa. Somebody say amen. I'll, I'll just keep going. Wisdom speaking up here. He's saying, not me, buddy. I like that. But I tell you what, not all of us can say not me. Amen. Thank God somebody amen besides the preacher. Anyway, so he says, and Esau seeing this, then when Esau unto Ishmael, unto the wives which he had had, um, Mahathalah, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. And Jacob went out, smart man, from Beersheba, and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place. And I love this story. Stay with me while we read through it. And tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that place and put them down for his pillows. Um, you couldn't find something softer to lay your head on, but in that land, to be quite honest, uh, no. <laughs> That's a, I don't know if you're familiar with the, with the Middle East or that part of the world, but it's just mostly desert and rocks. And that was about his choice. And I noticed that his that uh, the word there is plural, them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. I was amazed when that was in there because I thought he could go to sleep laying on a rock. That was a tired boy. He was exhausted. Or maybe better yet, maybe God had something to do with allowing him to sleep so he could dream the dream that he was going to dream. And behold, a ladder set up. How many know where we're at already? Jacob's Ladder. Everybody knows about Jacob's Ladder. It used to be a song. song we are climbing Jacob's. How many remember that old song? One or two of y'all do. All right, good. I'm glad I'm not the only person who remembers older things. <laughs> and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To do thee will I give it and to thy seed. Now we don't just have the blessing of the father passed to the son. Now we have the indelible stamp on the deed by the hand of God. I'm giving this land to you and your seed. We're talking about Jacob, whose name will be Israel, whose 12 sons, actually 10 sons and two grandsons, carry the tribes of Israel's names into infinity. And I see, by the way, those tribes are listed in the last book of the Bible and simply tells me there's nothing that's going to stop Israel until it's all over. It's there. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And in thee, again, here's this promise, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Here's why. By the way, you know the Messiah comes through that lineage. It comes through the tribe of Judah, one of the offspring, one of the twelve sons of Israel. And so we're seeing that his promise is that all the nations of the earth won't necessarily be blessed by the Jews themselves, I'll be blessed of the offspring of the Jew, a man whose name is Yeshua. And he is that Messiah. So he says, all the nations of the families of the earth shall be blessed. And behold, here's the promise I love. I am with thee. <laughs> Does that kind of stir? By the way, he made us the same promise. Remember what Jesus said? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. Amen? So uh, actually... We could say in every sense of the word, the bare promise that God made to Israel through Jacob, we have that now manifested in the person of the Messiah in us. Except 
He's not with us. He's in us. Isn't that a wonderful difference? So he says that, and he said, I am, and I will keep thee in all places whether thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. Now, by the way, here's what he's saying. Jacob, you're going to have to leave this land. I'm going to bring you back. And he says, and I'm, I will, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. You can leave, do what you need to do to get away from your brother, do what you need to do to go claim a wife from Laban. And by the way, uh, God didn't say to get two, but he winds up with two coming back, as you well know. But he says, I want to, all these things that I've spoken of, I want to do those things. In verse 16, and Jacob awakened, awaked out of his sleep, and he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. I just wanted to take a nap. Boy, what a nap. Man, what a revelation from God. And uh, by the way, please, let me, let me make a little sidebar here. Thank God we have, the, we have the absolute production and completion of the revelation of God in our hands tonight. God is not going to reveal any more secrets to you through dreams and visions in the sense of having new revelation. doesn't mean that God may not speak to you. doesn't mean that God may not show you something. But he is not going to give you new revelation. If he did, this book would be useless. We couldn't have a complete revelation. We'd have to depend on somebody's dreams and vision. So, and of course, the Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. But that's a different kind of vision. It means where there's no desire to reach toward other people. And of course, just a sidebar. And of course, he said in verse 17, and he was afraid. Well, I guess. And he said, how dreadful. By the way, the word dreadful there doesn't mean it does, it does mean something about fear, but it's a reverent fear. You know, I read this again this afternoon, and I thought, dear God, would that there'd be more reverence for you. Fear. Awesome. Awesome is that God is showing up, and that God is wherever. And whenever God shows up, I want to tell you, there won't be no screaming and jumping and hollering. We'll be on our face weeping before God. Well, God shows up in all of His power, there's some, he said, man, this is a dreadful, it's dreadful in this place. It's reverent, it's fearful. And this is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it, upon, set it up for a pillow and poured oil upon the top of it. That's, that's anointing that oil for a memorial. He was setting up something to remind him of the experience that he just had with God. Um, I think that we need to have memorials in our life. And what I mean by that, we, we ought to have a memorial of salvation. We ought to be able to comprehend the experience of the new birth. Uh, when it happens, in most cases, most of us uh, have no idea what God's doing in our life. We just know what, what we're asking Him to do. Forgiveness of sins, uh, the taking away of guilt, the taking away of of, of pain as far as the spiritual pain of life, the giving of a brand new life, the birthing uh, of a child being brought into the family of God, and all of that experience, let me tell you what, you need to drive a stake down as far as you can get it right there, and every time the devil comes haunting you, you take him back and say, look at that memorial, Mr. Slewfoot, that's where me and you had our separation, and God and I had our getting together. I'm not talking about a location, I'm talking about the experience. That's because I promise you the enemy will charge you and do everything he can to make you doubt your salvation. And if he can cause you to doubt your salvation, you'll sit on the pew the rest of your life because you will be afraid to do anything not knowing if you yourself are saved or not. Amen? So, a memorial. And then the Bible says in verse 19, and he called the name of that place Bethel. There's churches all over America named Bethel. So it's not a bad name. And of course, it means the house of God. And that's the meaning of it. When he set that up and he said to call that place Bethel, it used to be, and the Bible said, but the name of that city was called Luz at first. It was a different city. Now he said, no, no, no. We're going to name this place. It's going to be considered Bethel, the house of God. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace, 
Then shall the Lord be my God. Um, I need to talk to you a few minutes, Jacob. I don't think God's too impressed with your deal. Going to make a deal with God. I think the pledge is more like a vow to God. It wasn't, he wasn't trying to make a deal with God, in my opinion, because God was already, he said, this is God. God's shown up at my place. This is called the house of God. He recognized who God was. But it appears when he said, I'm going to make a vow, and he vowed a vow. And he said, if you'll do this, if you'll do that. By the way, all the things that he's saying, if you do, God's already promised to do. Clothing, food. By the way, do you know that's all God really promised? Food and clothing. Somebody said, well, what about a house? What about it? I'm glad to have one, aren't you? But, and that's certainly the mercy of God. But he only tells us in the New Testament, he repeats these very things. So he says, I'm going to come again to my father's house in peace. I want to come in peace. Now, you, you got to think in his mind, he's saying, oh, I don't have much choice to come in peace. Esau's going to never forgive me. He's going to kill me, sure as the world. But he says, I'm going to set this up, and I'm going to believe that. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give thee. Oh, man, he believed in tithing before it ever got fashionable. Isn't that something? There's no law yet. I in the world, I even had people tell me, tithing is under the law. Well, this is before the law. In fact, we can go all the way back to Melchizedek. We'll find that that was he. Uh, we know Moses gave tithe before there was a law. I'm set telling you something. A tenth is 10% is the tithe. That's God's of the first fruits. And whatever you do, believe me, God expects his off the top. I've had people say, wait a minute. I, I, I got to pay my insurance and I got to pay this off of mine. Oh, well, that's, that's good. That's okay. But uh, that's yours you're paying from. Don't use God's to pay your bills. I didn't know I was going here, but it's not costing y'all anymore. Amen. But amen. You know something about the law? Even if this was under the law, and I do believe this with all my heart, anything that we should do under the law, us under grace ought to do more. Amen. We're not bound by law. To be able to do it free will and say, Hallelujah, what a blessing to be able to do it because I don't have to do it. I'm doing it because I want to do it. By the way, he loves a cheerful giver. And a cheerful giver means people that are laughing as they give, not weeping. Oh, my God, it's time to give again. No, no, no. Hallelujah is a chance to give again. Amen. By the way, this church knows that. I don't need to repeat this over and over, but you do need to be aware of it. He said, I want to give a tenth of you, to you, God. Here's why. Because I know that what you give me is a gift. You don't have to give it to me. You don't have to. By the way, salvation is a gift. Aren't you glad you don't have to pay for that? That was priceless. That's a free gift of God. Um, let me make a statement about tithing because I have people ask me from time to time since I brought it up. Tithing begins in the heart before it does in the pocketbook. Because I've had some people that wanted to start tithing when they got where they needed to be with the Lord. And at that point in time, I've seen people who weren't able to do that. And my encouragement is this. If you really, really want to be obedient to God, you keep trusting God and you give all you can give, but don't lie to God about what you can give and what you can't give. You hear what I'm saying? But if you'll get there, I'll guarantee you, if your heart is set on doing that, doing what God wants, He'll make it possible for you to tithe and more. Well, the tithe goes beyond, giving goes beyond a tithe. It's called tithes and offering. Tithes is God. What you give is, that's not a giving. That's His. What you give above that is a gift of God. Y'all got that? Okay, I just want to make sure. You knew it already, didn't you? I wasn't telling you anything different, but I thought I'd tell you again anyway. By the way, repetition is the key of learning, is it not? Okay, we stop. We're going to stop there because uh, we're going to want to give us time to set up everything tonight and try to get out of here in time. But does anybody have a question about what we've, what we've been talking about? Yes, sir, Jerry. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. It was like anointing a memorial. 
That's what it was considered when you when oil was poured upon something that sanctified it, it set it apart. It was like saying, I'm going to be, this is going to be a reminder of what God did here this night. I'm going to pour the oil upon the stone and it will be probably meant a lot to nobody but to Jacob and God. But you would not, if you, if you walked by it, you probably would pay no attention to it. But Jacob would. You understand what I'm... Oh, they had the oil. The oil came, most of the oil came from different sources. Most of it was olive oil. A lot of it. And by the way, they, all shepherds carried oil because that's what they used to carry down and pour in the little, the little adder's holes where the snakes would bite the little sheep on the nose. They'd pour it in the hole so the snake couldn't climb up. He'd slide down. And so he were ever, the oil is to protect the sheep. The oil is a type of the Spirit of God, and that's what still protects the sheep. Sheep, 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 sheep. <laughs> Bad. Amen. All right. Good question, Jerry. All right. Anyone else have a question? Yes, ma'am. I tell you what, the day you get God figured out, let me know, and I'll be happy with you. And I don't mean. It, it, let me. I, let, I want to say this, and I'll, I'll say it because we've all had some of these same questions, right? Why in the world would God do that? Why did they let them have two wives back then? Why would they? You know, we've all had these questions. One thing that we know, when we look beyond what's happening, we'll see the results, and we'll know. Oh, okay. Not that God has to show us that, but God, Jacob, even though. And I, when you look at this, Jacob was a rascal, no doubt, in his youth. How many in here were not a rascal when you were your youth? Oh, okay. But God blessed us anyway down the line. There was a change in our life. I think this was a change in Jacob's life right here. From this point forward, Jacob seemed to, to, to be a man of character, and God blessed him as literal. But there was a change in his life. But I totally agree. When you first read these things and you see them, wow, why did God do so and so? By the way, God doesn't mind that you questioning Him at all. His own Son did that from the cross. My God, my God, why? But you know what? And I love this, and I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Jesus never got an answer. Why do we think we ought to have one? You ever thought about that? No answer. By the way, His humanity was crying out, and His deity answered, Your will. Your will, God. That's what he cried in the before. Remember, Jesus, here's a wonderful lesson. Jesus went to the garden before he went to the cross. Why? He had to surrender his flesh to the will of God. Three times it took him, falling on his face, saying, God, deliver me from this thing I've got to do. I don't want to deal with this. He was honest in his humanity. But every time his deity overcame and he said, not my will, but your will. Until we surrender our will to God, we're not ready for the flesh to die. So, wonderful illustration. Amen. Okay, come on, Brother Tony. Anyone else have a question while Tony's coming? I love questions. I don't always have answers. but And uh, some of it, I'm thrilled. Nothing.